Waiting tables is not for the weak. Waiting tables at a restaurant in one of San Diego's most affluent counties where the clientele primarily consists of wealthy old men is most definitely not for the weak. As a younger-ish woman that these old men tend to be particularly amused by, the money to be earned requires, dare I say, a little obligatory flirting, high-priced entrees with a side of free banter. I was waiting on two men having a business meeting, and as I interrupted to check on the meal, one of them bashfully ordered a non-alcoholic drink. He seemed embarrassed to be ordering ginger beer and club soda with an oversized ice cube. As I dropped it off, he playfully sought after reassurance and asked, do you think it's weird that I ordered this with a big rock? It's not weird at all, I respect it. I flirtatiously responded, well, of course you do, sweetheart. A big rock is every woman's dream. The old man said with a wink, glancing up from the large ice cube to my bare left hand. <laughs> Uncomfortably, I repeated it back and nodded in false agreement. Rent was due after all. <laughs> It really got me thinking about how my entire adulthood, I've prioritized my independence and my desire to live a creative, passion-filled life. In 30 years, a diamond ring has never been on my vision board. A lot of people do expect women to aspire to marriage, and many do. My visual manifestation designs, however, have always consisted of quotes encouraging self-love, style inspiration, and ripped leg muscles. <laughs> This isn't to say I'd never craved partnership, but over the years I dated both casually and seriously and nothing ever felt profound enough to make me change my mind. I'd adapted to a life where nurturing a relationship with myself was generally most rewarding. In addition to cultivating a strong inner relationship, I've also never had any interest in potentially recreating the environment I grew up in. It's one of my biggest life fears. Often, I recall afternoons with my sister spent crouched at the top of the stairs, eavesdropping on our screaming parents below. We absorbed the details of their wine-slurred sentences. As we exchanged glances in silence, fear coursing through our adolescent veins. Later in adulthood, we would discuss the countless instances in which we overheard their profanities and spilled secrets. Infidelity, addiction, hidden bank accounts. We don't exactly remember the excruciating specifics of their fights, but we do remember how it felt to see an example of marriage that makes you never want one. Mocktail Man's question, although presumptuous and a little old-fashioned, bombarded me with an awareness of that empty space between my left pinky and middle finger, and I felt a chilled breeze where the, price, uh, where the warmth of pricey metal could be resting under the knuckle. His comment got me thinking about the man who might fill that empty space one day, the man who did change my outlook on love, the man I had texted 10 minutes prior to say, work is good, can't wait to see you tonight. I thought to myself, hmm, okay, maybe tonight I will Pinterest some non-traditional bands just for fun. <laughs> we met in February of 2021. I was pacing nervously with anticipation in my living room, gearing up to meet a man I had been virtually chatting with on Bumble for several days. I peeked through my curtains, peering out into the early darkness of the evening. I think I'm here, the text read. A white Subaru crept up slowly in front of my apartment building and my stomach flipped, he was here. I had been creating mental fantasies around this Subaru driving granola man who <laughs> claimed his favorite book was For the Love of Men by Liz Plank. <laughs> of course, I had already found his Instagram and knew plenty of other bits of information. He did not volunteer. He doesn't follow countless half-naked models, openly values his family, and doesn't uh, have any pictures of any exes. I might have already taken notes from his Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and discovered his social security number, too. <laughs> Taking a deep breath, I glanced into the mirror and anxiously touched up my appearance for what felt like the millionth time. 
I grabbed my leather clutch, sprayed on an additional layer of Dolce & Gabbana light blue, and prepared to walk out into the warm San Diego winter air. My heart drummed in my chest, and as I approached the car, I walked to its rhythm with intention like I'm back in marching band. <laughs> I slowly opened the door. Instantly, I sensed that I just unlocked a new world for myself, but it's not Narnia. It's a foresight into a life where my solitude is no longer the sweetest thing. He looked the same as the pictures on his profile. Long dark hair pulled back in a bun, a thick beard, and kind eyes that combine every color of a mountainscape, various blues, greens, and browns. We locked eyes, and as he said hello, I was overcome with a warmth of familiarity. I don't exactly believe in love at first sight, but I remember feeling right at home the moment I heard his voice. It was the best first date of my life. We were seated in the back corner of a rooftop brewery, allowing us the privacy to nervously unwind over the course of several hours. Dimly lit with gas fire pits, the whole place flickered. Succulents decorated the tables. Between moments of laughter, he methodically asked me questions and listened sincerely, beaming with genuine interest. New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc warmed my blood and eventually we were cackling like old friends and shutting the place down. The chemistry was electrifying. Several dates later, he texted me, I'm all in on this and we've stayed together since. We've spent several years laying the foundation of a solid relationship, brick by brick, every layer being made with intention. When I downloaded the app, I only had the intention of continuing my lifestyle of casual fun, but somehow I'm one of the rare uh, dating app success stories and unexpectedly met the love of my life. <laughs> it's a weird flex. <laughs> <laughs> Evidently, it seems the best things in life present themselves when you aren't really swiping for them. <laughs> After three years of dating, it became time to take things to new levels, to raise the stakes on what we were building. It was time to meet his family. While he drove through the gated community in Chula Vista, suburbia, looking for parking, I sat passenger clutching an elaborate charcuterie board in my lap. Pieces of cheese and candied walnuts wiggled under layers of plastic wrap, unstable due to my nervous, shaky knees. Eventually, we found a spot several blocks away, and as we trekked forward through the evening darkness, my labored breathing revealed itself in the misty December air. As we approached the beautiful home, he slowed his walk and interrupted my mental spiral to ask, you ready? I wasn't sure, but there was no turning back. Inside, his family awaited, and my anxiety whispered insecure questions. What if they hate me? Or worse, what if they're as traumatic as my family? <laughs> my obsessive Instagram researching proved worthwhile once again because I was able to recognize that it was his cousin he ran into in Vegas at a music festival five years ago who opened the door for us. <laughs> A few giggling kids scurried past with gifts in their hands as we made our way through the home. Everyone was dressed in Christmas-themed pajamas and reggaeton was blasting. In the kitchen, each burner on the stove was occupied keeping various tamales warm. I was welcomed by everyone with open arms. After latching onto me all night with a passionate curiosity, his sister-in-law looked me in the eyes and softly said, you are a part of our lives now. I choked back the once frightened and now relieved tears that had been loading behind my eyes all night. I felt silly for having had fears in the first place. The kindness, the rich culture, and the traditions embedded within this holiday gathering shocked me and comforted me at the same time. Growing up, I truly feared family reunions. I remember making packs with my siblings, forming a plan to escape if necessary. It was always inevitable that they would end with some kind of emotional or sometimes even physical eruption. I had always felt so tainted by the flashbacks of two people hating each other so intensely, 
yelling so hard that the whole neighborhood flinched and the cul-de-sac homes jumped from their foundations in shock. Hardly even a teenager, and yet I was subjected to analyze a relationship of 20 years as it crumbled into ashes after decades of flames. Marriage, every woman's dream. That man with the mocktail spoke those words so confidently, but no, marriage has never been a dream of mine. But now, marriage very well could be a next step. And for the first time, I actually like that thought. I embrace it even. I fantasize about what our life could look like together, and it feels good to rewire my heart. My trauma no longer creates a roadmap of my future. Everything ahead of me is illuminated with joyous opportunity. I consider the moments in this life before our paths finally crossed, moments where I'd felt a void so large, my soul felt dark, and it's hard to connect with that version of me now. He came into my life like he's always belonged here. I'm at the forefront of every decision he makes, and I feel safe. He remembers every detail of my interests, supports my career, and considers me even in the smallest ways like making sure a pint of uh, Ben & Jerry's fish food is always in the freezer for me. <laughs> in his presence, every version of me has permission to exist freely without judgment, and so it helps me to love myself more because he reminds me that even in my lowest moments, I'm worth being cared for. He's helped me create a life I don't need to escape from a life in which my inner child is at peace and there are no more voids. Some people say you need to be healed before finding true love, but in my case, true love did the healing. My parents showed me a heartbreaking example of what marriage can be, but if there's a vow that I'm determined to make, it's to break that generational cycle and so, I ease into this love with an open mind. He isn't seat four at table 107. I'm not wearing an apron, and he's not asking for reassurance regarding his cocktail choices. And yet, once again, I'm faced with that familiar, invasive question. I laugh to myself as it repeats in my mind. Is a big rock weird? <laughs> Give it up for Vamp first timer, Lindsay Alderman.